Okay, let's go ahead and get started, if you would. What I want you to do is I want, to go, I want you to go back with me to the book of James. Go back with me to the book of James. There's a Steve and Ann. Hey, Steve and Ann, how are you? Go back with me to the book of James, chapter number one. And then also you're going to want to put a marker in Proverbs because we're going to be spending most of our time in Proverbs uh, today, which we've done the last couple of weeks at these uh, particular studies. Hey, there's... There's, there's Syl and Barry. How you doing there? Hey, there's Mary. Mary, how are you this morning? Good to see you. All right, pick back up at James chapter number one. We have spent a number of weeks together here in the book of James. If you are brand new to what we're doing in the book of James, you got, you got to get caught up, okay? <laughs> and the only way to do that is that these messages are posted on our website at helpersofyourjoy.com. So go and listen to those because there's some real important foundational information that has gotten us to where we are in the book of James right now. And what we're doing in James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8 here, let me read those verses. We'll open in a word of prayer, and then we'll get going. It says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let's ask the Lord to help us with our time and our study this morning. Our gracious God and Father, we're thankful again that we could spend a little bit of time here this morning in your word and in doing so to gain the edification, the wisdom, the insight that is here. Father, we know that that's what your word is. It's right from your thinking, right from your heart, right from your mouth to the pen and through the pen of the various Bible writers so that when we read the Bible, we are reading your word. We thank you for the wisdom, the edification, the instruction that we receive. And we thank you for this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as we have tried to say now uh, several times already here in James chapter 1, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8, when he begins this section by saying, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. I've tried to say in a number of different ways that James is telling his audience, and he's writing to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. He's telling his audience, he's telling Israel that they need to go to the word of God. If it's wisdom that they need, if it's wisdom that they want, they need to open God's written word. They need to go and study God's written word. The place where God has given wisdom to all men liberally, that's the word of God. And so we've tried to say that in many, many different ways the last several weeks as we're, as we're studying through this. Many people have the idea and that in many of the commentaries and preachers, when they come to this verse in the book of James, they say, well, if you lack wisdom, just kind of ask God and God somehow will open a window or close a door or somehow he'll, he'll turn a street light red or green if he wants you to go or red if he wants you to stop. And that's the wisdom of God. And that's nonsense. That, that's, that's superstition. All that superstition, that's, that's not about the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is in the word of God. And it's the word of God that James is telling his audience, the 12 tribes of Israel, as he's, as, as he's equipping them to go through that tribulation period. It's the scripture, it's the word of God that he's telling them, you've got to go to the word of God if you want to get God's wisdom and instruction to get through that tribulation period. Now that being the case, and because we're studying in the book of James here, that has taken us back to a, a, a critical book in the Word of God about the wisdom of God. And that's, of course, the book of Proverbs. That's how we got back to the book of Proverbs. That's why we are in the book of Proverbs right now. And as we started this several weeks ago, that is this section on the wisdom of God, I asked you to read Proverbs chapters 1 through 9, chapters 1 through 9, because there's so much in there about the nature of the book of Proverbs itself, but the Bible itself as a whole, okay? Now, just real quickly then, I want you to go back with me to Matthew 7, 
Go back to Matthew and chapter number 7 here. Matthew chapter number 7, Matthew chapter number 7, and notice what it says here. Matthew chapter number 7, at verse 13 and 14, it says this, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. This whole section in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the issue that Christ is presenting here is, who is it that is going to get into the kingdom of heaven? Remember, with the arrival of John the Baptist on the scene of human history, as well as the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ on the scene of human history, the pronouncement from God to Israel was the kingdom of heaven was at hand. The Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is preaching who's going to get into that kingdom. In fact, if you look at this same chapter, chapter 7 of Matthew and verse 21, he says this, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, then who is going to get into the thing? Back to verse 13 and 14. You see, he mentions you got these two ways, these two paths. You've got the wide way compared to the straight gate. You've got the broad way compared to the narrow way. Well, what we tried to say last week from the book of Proverbs, go back with me to Proverbs. Now you can let go of Matthew, but remember in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, you have those two ways, the two paths, the narrow, the straight, the broad way, or the wide way. And we're going to see in Proverbs, as we looked at this, I'm going to do this very, very quickly. I just want you to see a couple of real quick examples of this. Go over to chapter number three. Go over to chapter number three. And um, look, in fact, look over to chapter number four. Look over to chapter number four. I'm going to do this real quickly because this is review from last week. If you didn't hear the message last week, please go back and listen to it. But you can see that all the way through this section in Proverbs, he's comparing the the narrow way, the broad way, the straight way, the wide way, and so forth. And here's just an example. Look at chapter 4 of Proverbs, chapter 4 and verse 14. Chapter 4 and verse 14, and he says this, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. That's the broad way. Jump down to verse 18. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. There's the narrow way. That's the path of the just. The path of the just is to follow the Word of God. And the Word of God is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. It's going to take them closer and closer and closer and closer, and then eventually into that perfect day that is into the kingdom. If you'll notice verse 19, the way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. You see that there? I'm, I'm saying this, that in when the Lord Jesus Christ mentioned that in Matthew 7 about, about the narrow way and the broad way and so forth, all that is based upon the fact that God's word has laid out for God's people that there's these two paths, there's these two ways. You've got the broad way that's going to lead to destruction. And that is they're going to reject God's word. The narrow way the straight gate, as it, as it were, the narrow way is to trust God's wisdom in God's word. And that's what's going to take them into the kingdom. 
And so that's kind of a real quick summary or review from last week. Although, again, if you haven't listened to the lesson last week on, on Proverbs here, please go back and listen to it and make the connection with the book of James. Now, what we're going to do today in the book of Proverbs, we're going to go and look at chapter number eight of Proverbs. And need, need I say that, wow, there's a lot we have to go over, okay? <laughs> so Proverbs chapter number eight. Proverbs and chapter number eight. And we've just, there's so much to go over here. That, and, and I am going to attempt to actually do this in our time this morning, okay? In Proverbs chapter number eight, watch how it starts. And again, I want you to think about this Proverbs as though you were a member of the Jewish little flock in the tribulation period and you were reading the book of James. And James told you, if you need wisdom, you need to ask of the Lord. And so you go back to Proverbs and you're reading Proverbs and you're getting the wisdom of God in Proverbs, which is going to tell you basically to focus on the word of God is what it's going to do. It's going to tell you to follow this path and not that path. Go this way and not that way. Flee to this place and not to the pl that place and so forth. So watch Proverbs chapter number eight here then. It begins... Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? Now that verse right there takes us back to chapter number one of Proverbs, which we looked at a few weeks back. Chapter number one of Proverbs, beginning at verse 20, chapter one, verse 20, go back there. Proverbs chapter one, verse 20 was a prophecy, as it were, a prediction, a prophecy about the time in Israel's history in which God would send the Messiah and the Messiah would be speaking the word of God, which is the wisdom of God, crying unto Israel to come and repent and return to God. When you go to Proverbs chapter number one, verse 20, notice the connection that says this. Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates, in the city she uttereth her words. The Lord Jesus Christ in the cities of Israel was uttering the words of God, which was the wisdom of God, okay? Verse 22, how long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity and the scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge? Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you and I will make known my words unto you. There's Christ's ministry to Israel. He calls them to repentance. They reject him, of course. He pours out his Holy Spirit upon them in early acts and makes known his words. If you were to keep reading Proverbs chapter number one, we're not going to do it this morning because we did it a couple of weeks back and everything. You can see that that's the continuation of the prophecy program in Proverbs chapter number one. They're going to go into the tribulation period. Those that rejected the word of God at the mouth of Christ, they went on the broad way instead of the narrow way. And you can see down at verse 31, therefore, therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. That's going to be those in, at the end of that tribulation period who rejected to trust God's word. They're going to be destroyed when the Lord returns. Uh, look at verse 33. But whoso hearkeneth unto me. That's the believing remnant there out of Israel. That's those who would read the book of James and believe James and say, wow, let's go to the word of God. Let's find the wisdom of God from the word of God. But whoso hearkeneth to me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. They're going to be protected. They're going to find those safe places. And then eventually they're going to get into the kingdom. Okay. So come back with me to Proverbs chapter number eight. It's clear that Proverbs chapter eight, verse one has taken our attention back to chapter number one. And the time in history when Messiah was going to be on the scene of human history calling to Israel with the word of God, which is the wisdom of God, to, for them to come and repent. Now keep reading. It says this, She standeth in the top of high places, by the way in the places of the paths. 
she crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in at the doors. See, there's obviously, she's, she's making herself, wisdom is making herself available where anyone and everyone that passes by can hear her and respond, as it were. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things, for my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing froward or perverse in them. And we need to slow down a little bit and think about what we just read there. We need to slow down a little bit and think about the claims that those verses just said, verse 6, 7, and 8. What I want you to do is this. I want you to go back to Proverbs chapter number 2. What is it? Look over to Proverbs chapter number 2. Look over to Proverbs chapter number 2, verse 6. And he says this. For the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Okay, now I got a question for you. We've looked at that verse already probably three or four times in a row now. And I asked you, to either remember or to, I think I asked you to write down next to that verse or in your notes, write down a passage of scripture that that verse clearly is speaking about. Does anybody remember what that verse was? Actually, there were two of them, okay? When that verse says this in, in Proverbs 2, 6, for the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth, cometh knowledge and understanding. What, what is that a reference to? You, you, you can type into the chat right now. Everyone start typing into the chat right now. What is that a reference to? When that verse says, For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. What is that a reference to? Start typing some answers in there, okay? Because uh, that's right. It's a reference to the Bible. It's a reference to Scripture. Here, here's the verse that I want you to uh, be writing down, two of them. Okay, yeah. Uh, let's see. Rocky has it. Uh, Matthew 4 and verse 4. Everybody turn there, please. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Matthew chapter number 4 and verse 4. Jeff has it as well. Jeff and Alice, thank you. Pam has it as well, Matthew 4.4 4 and Luke 4.4. 4. Henry, Scripture, that's exactly the right answer. Ken, Luke 4.4, 4, that's exactly right. Both those verses. Listen, you got, look over to Matthew chapter number 4, verse 4. Matthew 4 and verse 4, it says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's exactly right, Sue. It's his word, okay? That's so critical to, to make sure that we grasp that concept. Multiple times in the Old Testament, as well as the passage like that in the, in the New Testament, you see this idea that God has absolutely given wisdom. He has made it known. It came out of his mouth. It got written down. All scripture, scripture is a reference to what got written down. Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed. He breathed into Adam. Think of it this way. Remember, he made Adam of the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Why, when God breathed into Adam's nostrils, why did he breathe into Adam the breath of life? It's because that's what was in God. He didn't breathe out of himself the breath of death. He breathed into Adam what was in himself. God had life in 
himself, when he breathed into Adam the breath of life, man became a living soul. When you have breath that comes out of God's mouth, it's something that's living. It's something that's alive. It's the word of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ speaks about that. He says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. When that verse says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, it's a reference to scripture. Go back to Proverbs chapter number two there. Go back to Proverbs chapter number two. So when that verse says, verse six, for the Lord giveth wisdom. Okay, well, where? I mean, on, on Google, on Wikipedia, where? No, no, no. Uh, it, it's out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. If it's wisdom that you want, you got to go to the scripture. If it's wisdom and knowledge and understanding that you want, you got to go to the Word of God. Not the theologians, not the seminaries and so forth, not human viewpoint, not philosophy, not your evolutionists, none of that stuff. If it's God's wisdom that you want, you got to go to God's Word. That's pretty clear, right? Have we made that clear? I, I hope so. So with that in mind, Go back then to Proverbs chapter number 8. Go back to Proverbs chapter number 8. And think of these verses. Because Proverbs 8, verse 6, 7, 8, 9. And all, all through this section, he's, he's saying the same things kind of in a different way. Look at what he says about, not, about what wisdom is, where it came from. It says at verse 6 now, Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. See how he opens his lips. He talks, and what comes out of his mouth are excellent things. They are right things. Quickly, go to chapter number 22. You, you guys have heard me say, of, of all the verses in the book of Proverbs, these two are, well, I can't say my favorite, but boy, they're sure way up there at the top, okay? And I imagine that they are for you as well. Because Proverbs is just truly a book of Proverbs, okay? <laughs> Amazing wisdom and insight. But watch this. Take the, when, when we just, those words, excellent things, excellent things, bring that with you to chapter number 22 of Proverbs. And he says this. It says, Have not I written to thee excellent things? Wait, 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 wait. Hold that verse. Come back to chapter 8. Come back to chapter number 8. Verse 6. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things. Proverbs chapter number 22, verse 20 says, Have not I written? You see, not only did God speak, but he made sure it got written down. Let me say it this way. If God was simply just to talk, but he never had it written down, how would we know what he said? It would just disappear into the air, as it were. You see, both verses, when you consider what's going on here, God's wisdom, it came out of the mouth of God. He spoke it, but then he saw fit that it got written down. Now go back to chapter 22 there. Look what he says. Verse 20. Have not I written to thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. The God of the Bible is a God who does not and cannot lie. When he speaks, he speaks truth. In fact, he speaks the words of truth. So if you're going to write down the words that came out of the mouth of the God of the Bible, the words that are going to be written down are the words of truth. And they are said to be 
excellent things. They are said to be things that are of certainty. Now go back with me over to Proverbs chapter number 8 here. He says at verse 6, verse 6, Here, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak, watch this, truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. When that verse says, my mouth shall speak truth, he's conveying to the audience here that you can trust what he says. It's the truth. It will not lead you astray. It will not let you down. It will not make you ashamed. It will get you to what he promises you. It'll take you to where he leads you. He says at verse 8 now, all the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. You know what? Think about that verse right there. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. Let me kind of get off on a tangent a little bit, but an important tangent. You know, we, we take a pretty strong stand here at this ministry for, in our language, the Bible, specifically the King James translation of the Bible. When you look at a verse like that, it says, all the words of my mouth are in righteousness. It doesn't say some of the words. It doesn't say most of the words. It doesn't say 98.9% .9 of the words. It says, all the words of my mouth are in righteousness. If a book claims to be the word of God, then what percentage of the words W-O-R-D-S. If a book claims to be the Word of God, then what percentage of the words have to be in pure righteousness? What percentage of the words have to be right, pure, accurate, spot on? What percentage? Go ahead and start, start typing some answers in there if you would, okay? Let me ask it a different way. If a book claims to be the Word of God, which is the product of the, what God said that got written down and so forth, then how often can it have words of unrighteousness in it? Well, how about never? <laughs> how about if that book claims to be the Word of God, and that verse right there says, all the words of his mouth are unrighteousness. That means 100%. They have to be right. So if you have a book that claims to be the Word of God and it has even one mistake in it, then I submit to you that is not God's Word. It doesn't contain all the words that are spoken in righteousness. Now, we, we've talked about that in the past. Let's kind of get back on track here, okay? Look at what he says at verse 8. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. They are plain to him that understandeth and write to them that find knowledge. Receive my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold for wisdom is better than rubies and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. Now think about what's going on in that section right there. That through this whole section in Proverbs as well, that, that there is a comparison with something that's more valuable than gold and silver and precious stones. The topic, to the message this morning is what's better than gold and silver and precious stones? What's better than gold and silver and precious stones? In the book of Proverbs, there's this, there's this comparison. There's something that, that even as valuable as silver and gold and precious stones and rubies as, as that they are, there's something that's more precious than that. In the tribulation period, remember, they're going to have to sell all that they have. They don't want to serve mammon. They won't, don't want to be tempted with, with silver and gold and precious things like that. There's something else that's going to be much more precious and valuable and necessary for the believers at that time that will get them through the tribulation period and into the kingdom in which they will be multiple, blessed hundredfold and so forth. And guess what it is? That's right, it's the Word of God. See the comparison he says here, verse 10, he says, Receive my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. 
For wisdom is better than rubies, and all things that may be desired are not to be compared unto it. Someone comes along and tempts members of that little flock there, hey, I'll give you some silver, I'll give you some gold, I'll give you some rubies, you just got to come and take the mark of the beast. No, that's, that's, that, don't do that. Trust God's word. He says at verse 13, uh, verse 12 says, I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Now, I'm, I'm going to, in order for me to get through what I want to get through this morning, I'm going to have to leave a lot of this out, okay? So I'm going to jump ahead. Look with me, if you would. Oh, man, how do I do this? <laughs> Look at verse 14. He says, counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding, I have strength. By me kings reign, and princes decree justice. By me princes rule, and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. I hope right there in that verse, that just, in your mind, I hope that brought up Matthew 19, where the Lord Jesus Christ promised the 12 apostles they would sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The apostles, the leadership of Israel, are going to use the word of God to judge and rule and administer over Israel in the kingdom. And so too, the leadership of Israel during the tribulation period, those are the ones that are going to be the faithful leaders to take them back to the word of God. Keep reading. Verse 17, I love them that love me. And those that seek me early, guess what? They're going to find me. James is telling his audience, if it's wisdom that you need, ask the Lord. Go seek it out of his word. Riches and honor are with me. Yea, durable riches and righteousness. Don't worry about the riches and the honor that the Antichrist is going to offer to you, he's saying to the little flock in the tribulation period. Rather, trust the riches and honor and righteousness that the word of God is offering to you. Verse 19, my fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. Don't be tempted by the gold and the silver and the precious stones that the Antichrist is going to offer you, that unless you take that mark of the beast, you can't buy or sell. But if you'll take the mark of the beast, I'll offer you riches and gold and abundance. Don't be tempted to take that. Instead, trust the word of God, the wisdom of God. He says, verse 20, I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment that I may cause. See, see he's going to lead. He's going to, he tells them to the lead, the, the paths of the just, the paths of righteousness. You see, verse 21 now, that I may cause those that love me. There's the remnant. There's the faithful remnant in Israel. Those that value God's word that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance and I will fill their treasures. There's the kingdom. God's word is going to take them through the tribulation period and into the kingdom. God's word is going to do for them what he promised and what it says he will do. What it will do. Now, when you come to verse 22, there is a huge shift that occurs. Not about the nature of the Word of God, but there's a huge shift in how wisdom is being presented to the audience here. This is just amazing. This is just, well, <laughs> I think, let, let, let's just go on. Look, look what he says. Verse 22, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there was no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. Now there's a big debate among a lot of people about what that is or who that is. 
When it says at verse 22, the Lord possessed me. Verse 23, I was set up. Verse 24, I was brought forth. Verse 25, at the end, I was brought forth. There is a, there is a doctrine out there that is a heretical doctrine that says, see, this passage is speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ and that there was a time when he didn't exist and then he was brought forth. And then God, and then when God brought him forth, then God used him to create everything else. It's the idea, the sense that Jesus is somewhat of a lesser God than God the Father. And commentary after commentary, you'll see that they interpret this passage as though it is a reference to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now wait a minute. It, if, if that is so, you've got some questions you need to ask and answer. First of all, in the context, go back to verse 1. Doth not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? Verse 2. She standeth. Time and time and time and time again in this section, wisdom is personified as a woman, not as a man. So you think, okay, well then that doesn't sound like it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Second of all, if the Lord Jesus Christ is eternal with the Father, then was there ever a time when the Lord Jesus Christ didn't exist and then had to be brought forth? Of course, the answer not if he was eternal, right? So you understand that, the, that, that Proverbs 8 is not focusing primarily on the Lord Jesus Christ, but rather on the wisdom of God. Well then, what is it a reference to? This idea that, verse 22, it says, the Lord, back at verse 22, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was, I brought forth. You know what he's speaking about right here? In this whole section now, once again, the same thing he's been speaking about all along. He's speaking about the Word of God. I want you to turn with me over to Psalms 119. Go to Psalms 119. Go to Psalms 119. Go to Psalms 119 and notice what it says here. Verse 89. Look over to Psalms 119 and verse 89. Psalms 119, verse 89, and it says this. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Think about the nature of the word of God. Before God ever saw fit to have his word written down on paper on the earth, it had already been settled and written in heaven. Think about that. It's the eternal word of God. Now come back with me if you would to Proverbs chapter number 8 and think about that. So the, the, the I here is the word of God. Watch this now. Proverbs chapter number 8 back at verse 22. The Lord possessed me. Think the scripture, the word of God. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. So before Genesis 1, 1, be, before God who was in everlasting begins the creation, he's got his word with him. 
he, he's got the Scripture with him, as it were. Well, that's what it says. I was set up from, ever, from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. So another thing you see about this idea of brought forth doesn't mean the idea of created, but rather this idea. Look, look, look let me give you an illustration. Okay, hopefully you're looking up here. I'm, I'm standing at the pulpit right now. Let's say that I had my Bible down here in the drawer in the, in the shelving down here. And then I'm going to begin the message. So I bring it forth. I open it up and I start following the, the, the words. That's the idea of bringing forth. He had his word with him from eternity. He brings his word. He opens it up. And then as the marvelous creator and orchestrator of his plan called glory that he is, he looks at the sheet music, as it were, like an or like, like a, like a, like a orchestra director. He looks at the music. He looks at, at the chords. He looks at the song. And then he begins to work, as it were. That's what's going on here. Look over to Proverbs chapter number 8 once again. He says, verse 26, While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, think about that word prepared. If you prepare something, you're getting it ready for something you're going to do. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. The, the, the scripture says that not God, God not only spread out the heavens, he stretched out the heavens like a curtain, nice and taut. He garnished the heavens. When, when, you, when you look at words like this, prepared the heavens, spread the heavens, stretched, garnished, it sounds like he's following a plan. It sounds like he's following blueprints of some kind. He says at verse 27, When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. Job 38, it talks about the face of the deep is frozen. When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment. That's Job 38 right there. That is Job chapter number 38 and 39 and 40. All these details there. He says, uh, uh, he says at 29, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth. Please, that's write down Job 30. That's Job 38. Is that Job? That's Job 38. I'm coming out of my boots here. I'm just I'm trying to convey this, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm losing it, okay? That, that, this is Job 38 right here. Verse 30 says, then I, was with, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily... His delight, rejoicing always before him. Okay, go to Genesis chapter number one. Go to Genesis chapter number one. Look at this. Think about, okay, I was daily his delight. I was daily his delight. Let, let me, watch this. Over in Genesis chapter number one, verse three. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. Jump down with me a little bit further, if you would. Look over to verse 10. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he sees. And God saw that it was good. Look over to verse 11. 
God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, the fruit trees yielding fruit after his kind, whose suit is in, in itself upon the earth. And it was so. I'm sorry, verse, right, right at the end of verse 10 it says, And it was good. Look at verse 12. Right at the end of verse 12. It was good. You see that there? Look right at the end of verse 18. It was good. Right at the end of verse 21. It says, It was good. A little bit further ahead to verse 25. It was good. Jump down to verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. I'm saying this. When you come back to Proverbs chapter number 8, and that verse says at verse 30, that, that talking about the creation, the foundations, the heavens, the earth, and so forth, it says at verse 30, Then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight. As he, as he would speak on day one, let there be light. And there was light. He would go back and he would check the scripture, as it were, and he said, that's good. It was his delight. Daily. You read down through those days and everything. He says, it was good on the third day. It was good on the fourth day. It was good on the fifth day. It was good on the sixth day. It was good. He was, it was daily. He, he compared what his word said with what the result of his spoken word was. And he said, yeah, it was good in that it matched perfectly. Go back with me to Proverbs chapter number 8. He says at verse 31, Rejoicing in the habitable part of the earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. But th again, that's Job, that's Job 38 right there. The sons of God, the sons of God uh, uh, sh shouted for joy. The sons of men, Adam and their descendants and so forth, shout for joy. And, and, and rejoice in, in, in the blessings of the earth and so forth. Okay, now, so verse, verse 22 to 31 focuses on that even at the creation of heaven and earth and the details of it, His Word was right there by His side. God Himself when, when, when preparing the heavens, when spreading the heavens, stretching them, garnishing them, laying the foundations of the earth, bringing forth the mountains, the seas, the plants, all he, he was following His Word. He used His Word and He followed it perfectly. Now, why do I need to know that? Well, let's see. He says at verse 32 now, Now therefore hearken unto me. The me is the word of God. O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me. Watching daily at my gates waiting at the posts of my doors. You know what the gates of the Word of God? Open the gates up. Check out the posts. Wait by the posts. The Word of God is where they need to go to to get the wisdom of God. Go there daily. Wait anxiously for it, He's saying to them. And verse 34 says, Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my door. For whoso findeth me, findeth, guess what? Life and shall obtain favor of the Lord. They're going to get through that tribulation period and they're going to get into the kingdom. God, it, it, the point is this. Why would God here in Proverbs chapter number 8 bring to their attention that even He Himself was bound to His Word. Even He Himself used His Word in the creation. It is to say to the remnant. It is to say to those that are seeking the wisdom of God. And by parallel, 
it is to say to you and me that if God followed His Word and His Word produced what His Word said it would produce, it brought it forth, it will do the same thing for them. If God's Word guided him through what he did, his Word will bring his plan and purpose to utter total fruition and completeness and perfection. And they can trust God's Word just like God trusted God's Word when it came to the creation of heaven, the foundations of the earth, and everything that he did. It will take them through. Look at verse 36 now. But he that sinneth against me, that is, he rejects God's word. He won't seek the wisdom of God in God's word. He that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me, they love death. Look at the contrast here. Look at verse 21. Look at verse, uh, I'm sorry, 17. 817, it says, I love them that love me, jump ahead to verse 21, that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasures, to verse 36, verse 36, but he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul, all they that hate me love death. You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A person's attitude towards the Word of God in any dispensation has a direct impact on where they're going to spend eternity. And in particular, in that tribulation period, James is saying, guys, if, if, if it's wisdom that you need, you, you need to turn to the Word of God. You need to follow that, that narrow way that path of the just, that path of the righteous, and that path can be found in the Word of God if God Himself was bound by, if He used His own Word when it came to bringing forth this entire creation, then is it not true that God's Word will also get you through the tribulation period and into the kingdom? You're going to either love God's Word and then they'll get into that kingdom. Those that hate God's Word, they love death. They're on this other path, that broad way, the path of the unjust, the path of the wicked. So the place, regardless of what dispensation that we're in, is it's the Word of God, the place to find wisdom. And let's let the Lord and His Word to really help us see the depth and the marvelous beauty that is here. Let's just close in a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you that we could spend some time this morning looking into these things. And though we have gone through this quite, quite, quite fast, quite quickly, Father, help us in, in that we have gone through it so quickly to not think that it is not valuable. There's so much amazing treasure here in this, in this Proverbs with, with, with Job 38 and other passages. And just like you are instructing them that your word is the place where your wisdom can be found, so too that we would understand that marvelous, wonderful truth. In Christ's name we give thee praise and honor. Amen.